All right, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we are live for some AP Euro review, some AP Euro q and I'm going to be live for the next All hour right, or so. Oh, my goodness. Like I need to turn that thing off. AP OK, Euro. so those of you who are in the chat, OK, make sure that let's go ahead and do the questions via Twitter. OK, so questions via Twitter. Um, now that's going to be at Tom Ritchie. OK, so at Tom Ritchie, make sure to ask your questions via Twitter. Now, if you don't follow me on Twitter, I won't see your question. OK, so just make sure that you are following first. My Twitter is set up. My Twitter feed is set up to take questions from followers only. If you don't follow me, I don't see you. You follow. Therefore, you are. If you don't follow me on Twitter, how do I even know you exist if we apply the scientific revolution? So I follow Tom Ritchie on Twitter. Therefore, I am. I tweet, therefore I am. Uh, you know, the thing is, what tweets must exist, okay? What tweets must exist? And if you are following me, it's confirmation of your existence. Now, you can uh, keep it appropriate, ladies and gentlemen, in the chat, um, but I'm not really going to be looking at the chat. I'm going to be looking at Twitter. And of course, preference is going to go to people who've been following me for a long time and all of that kind of stuff. North Salem, so glad that y'all are here. Now, I want to let y'all know of a few things. While I'm waiting on some questions to come in via Twitter, I want to let you know what's up. Okay, so let's go ahead and make a few notes here. I'm going to share my screen so that y'all can see the good stuff. Okay, now first of all, um, ask your questions via Twitter. That is at Tom Ritchie. Okay, so ask your questions there and I'll go through there and see what we've got. Now, my Romulus Euro app, okay, it's only $2.99 on the App Store and Google Play. It's just a little trivia app, but it's a trivia app with a purpose. Now, are the questions stimulus based? No, the questions are trivia based. Why, Richie? Well, the thing is that when you're when you're answering SAQs, the DBQ, LEQ, uh, you're having to come up with specific evidence on your own. And so the trivia drill is really helpful for helping you to retain specific evidence. So going through there, making sure that you've got that stuff that you're going to need to present for evidence on the DBQ LEQ. Now also even on the multiple choice, that the background there, the basic building blocks of everything you're gonna need to know is trivial knowledge. So if you go to, uh, the App Store or Google Play, it's available on both, Romulus Euro, okay? So you wanna make sure to get a hold of that app if you haven't already. It's only $2.99, nice little investment in your uh, in your future, in your, uh, in your success, okay? It certainly could not hurt. So make sure that you get a hold of the Romulus app, Romulus Euro, ladies and gentlemen. And so with that, then I want y'all to know, and a link is in the description, that at 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to be leading a multiple choice strategy session. Okay. And that is going to be focusing on, it's not just me answering a few questions about how to do multiple choice. It's going through, it's modeling, it's getting very in depth. That's why I'm charging for it. It's not the sort of thing that, okay, hey, what are a couple tips on multiple choice? I'm actually going to go through this with you. So that is going to be at nine o'clock, assuming enough people sign up. Now, if we don't have enough people sign up, then your money will get refunded. No problem, okay? But this is, uh, you see the link in the description for the multiple choice strategy session. And when you buy it, if you want, you know, if you've got some friends with you or something like that, I think you can only log in once, but if you've got some friends with you, then that's great. So that's going to be starting at 9 p.m. So the Romulus app and make sure you know that I am going to be offering that premium multiple choice strategy session. And that's going to go really in depth. We're not going to be shouting out to people and all that kind of stuff. We're going to be working. Uh, the premium sessions are what a lot of people say that they get the most out of because we really get down to business. So if you're really serious, give that some thought uh, of joining that premium session. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, told you about the app, told you the session that I'm doing later. Um, let's go ahead and take uh, a look and see what questions are coming in. And so uh, Alice has got some questions. Okay. So with that, uh, let's make sure. Okay. So, all right. All right. Going through, uh, going through that. All right. We've got uh, now 
time period too. Okay. You've basically asked me, Carm John, to go over a like a whole quarter of the course. Okay. So Richie, can you go over a whole quarter of the course? That's not how this works. Okay. So ask uh, a very ask a more specific question than that. Okay. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, much appreciation to Mr. Uh, Strasser um, for uh, doing this. All right. So Luke Skywalker. Now I'm also going to I'm uh, a direct you to videos in a lot of cases. I'm going to remind a lot of people that I've got videos where I go in depth here. So I do have a video on the War of the Spanish Succession. It is one of the videos in my series on Louis the Fourteenth's Wars. Now, as far as that goes, as far as that goes, we've got Charles the Second of Spain inbred level five. Okay, like in the video, I've got sound effects on there, but he was like just like way inbred okay this is like uh, game of thrones except maybe almost worse okay that at inbred level five mother nature's like you know what i'm not going to allow this to continue there's not going to be an inbred level six and so charles the second didn't have any children charles the second of spain now charles the second of england remember england and scotland had plenty of children it's just none of them were with his wife and so in the will of charles the second of spain it designated one of louis the 14th's relatives. Now, remember that Charles II was a Habsburg. And so what you're going to see here is that he named one of Louis the, the 14th's relatives as his successor. So that would have it going from the Spanish throne going from the Habsburgs to the Bourbons. And what that was, now Louis the Fourteenth was one of the threats to the European balance of power. So with that, remember this whole theme of the balance of power in Europe. And so Louis the Fourteenth, uh, you know, is trying to expand the influence of the Bourbon monarchy. And so a coalition assembles to stop this from happening. And essentially, Louis has some setbacks at first, but but he ends up fighting the coalition to a draw. And so as a result of that, you've got the Treaty of Utrecht, okay? As the Dutch would say it, okay? I've got on my Dutch shirt today. If anybody notices, I intentionally wore a Dutch shirt uh, just to show that uh, how much I love the Netherlands um, and all of the wonderful Dutch people and Dutch history, okay? And everybody that, that goes to the Netherlands, okay? That if you even set foot there, uh, then I am crazy about you. So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, that what happens in the Treaty of Utrecht, then the, the coalition like, you know what? You want to put a Louis the 14th like relative on the Spanish throne, fine. But you can't combine the span you can't combine the two thrones. That there's got to be an agreement that there's not going to be any combination here of the two. And this is really kind of a turning point because you see the end of the dynastic wars. And so Britain is already thinking, kind of forward thinking. Britain's like, we'll go along with this if you will give us Gibraltar, which Gibraltar is a very strategic point in terms of naval power that the British are thinking, you know what, you want to put a relative on this throne, whatever, as long as you don't combine them. But what we want is a naval base. So they are looking forward and we're seeing that uh, the heyday of the Royal Navy, uh, which is going to uh, control and still controls, the British still control Gibraltar, which uh, was interesting during Brexit, that uh, even though in the in the UK, Brexit was, uh, you know, in England, it, uh, it won. But in Gibraltar, it was about 90% were against Brexit because, of course, that's right there in Spain right in the middle of the European Union. And so the Treaty of Utrecht also ended Louis XIV's wars. And so that is just a brief overview of the War of the Spanish Succession. Um, but remember to uh, you know, go ahead and if you want a more in-depth thing, I've got a video on that. Garage Man. I also have a video on mannerism. All right. So there's also a video on mannerism. Mannerism is late Renaissance art. Okay. So when we think about mannerism, it's Renaissance art, but not exactly. Okay. So Renaissance art, of course, is striving for perfection. And what happens is when you get into the late Renaissance, um, that artists have really kind of uh, been through that kind of thing already. Now I've got also not only a video on manner mannerism, but I've also got a set of lecture notes. If you Google mannerism, Tom Ritchie, you can also see 
see a set of lecture notes that I've put out there on my website slash uh, blog. Okay, so mannerism notes AP Euro. Um, then what you're going to see is yes, you'll see mannerism AP Euro lecture notes. Okay, so that's going to be something you might want to look at. And 1527, that's when troops that were uh, loyal to Charles V. Uh, Charles V had a had a run in with the Pope, and so Charles V's troops went into Rome and just sacked the place. And it's kind of seen as the end. 1527 is seen as the end of the High Renaissance. Okay, it is the end of the High Renaissance and the beginning of the late Renaissance. And so you don't see the artists striving for the same sort of perfection, but there is a, a little bit of creativity here. And it's kind of building a bridge between high Renaissance art and the Baroque because artists like, um, you know, Parmigianino and El Greco, they are getting into things that are starting to foreshadow. Like if you look at El Greco, his, uh, his art is very much, uh, now it's a way ahead of its time. Okay. It's not looking for literal perfection, a lot of the figures tend to be elongated. And I go into this more in my lecture on mannerism. So you can take a look at the lecture and or the lecture notes that I've got uh, online. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, we've got almost 400 here watching. Make sure to tell your friends and remember uh, that uh, the Romulus app is out there, ladies and gentlemen. So those of you who have come in more recently, remember that I've got an app on the App Store and Google Play. The Romulus Euro app um, is available on both platforms uh, on uh, iOS and Android for only $2.99. And it's a little trivia app to help you with the stuff you need, uh, the specific knowledge. It's not to help you with stimulus based multiple choice, but to help you with specific evidence on the part of the exam that you actually have to come up with stuff on your own for. And then remember, multiple choice strategy session. There is a link in the description that is going to start at nine o'clock. Okay, so with that, let's go back to Twitter at Tom Ritchie. That's where I'm taking questions. So make sure to follow at Tom Ritchie and to go from there. All right, so uh, let's see, do I say uh, Violi? Voila, voila, how am I saying this? But anyway, um, can I go over the Enlightenment, okay? Which the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment are both focusing on a greater degree of rationality. OK, that we need it's it's fundamentally the scientific revolution is to is redefining the way that we look at truth, that truth must either be two, one of two things or both. OK, that depending if you're into rationalism, rationalism says that in order to be true, something must make sense. OK, so we must be able to make sense of it. So Descartes, for example, was a rationalist. Um, he was somebody that was like, how do I know that I exist? Now, remember, ladies and gentlemen, if you follow me on Twitter, if you tweet, uh, then, you know, what tweets must exist and you have confirmation of your existence. And so with that, confirm your existence, follow me on Twitter and you'll be able to ask me questions during these things. And so with that rationalism, Descartes like, how do I even know that I exist? And so then he's like, what thinks must exist? I am thinking deductive reasoning. I think, you know, what thinks must exist. I am thinking ergo I exist. Now I do have a video on Descartes. I've got a video on Copernicus and Galileo. Uh, I've got a video comparing the scientific revolution and the enlightenment and looking at both the similarity and the difference, how one is leading to the other. Now rationalism, is about something making sense. Then there's empiricism, okay? And it's not about making sense, but it's about sensing things, okay? So empiricism is about, it's true because I have seen it, I have touched it, I have tasted, um, or, uh, you know, or smelled it. And so as far as that goes, I know something exists because I've experienced it. And so empiricism is the other thing about the scientific revolution. And so empiricism and rationalism in the scientific revolution, they're much more in terms of just sciencey stuff. Like Sir Francis Bacon died doing something like he's like, I wonder if I stuff these chickens full of snow or something, how long they're going to survive. It was some kind of crazy experiment. And with that, OK, with that, what happened here uh, was that he ended up getting, uh, you know, get, like 
freezing to death. There was something. He died. He got sick and died doing some crazy experiment. All he really cared about was science, whereas the Enlightenment is about taking these scientific principles and applying them to society. And so when we think about, for example, Montesquieu writing uh, The Spirit of the Laws, where he gets into separation of powers, checks and balances, how can we set up a government scientifically, a government that's going to work, a government that takes into account human nature? Now, of course, that's assuming you believe in human nature. Remember that Locke was a tabula rasa guy. But a lot of the Enlightenment philosophes, they're looking at human nature in, in much the same way as Hobbes looked at it, that people tend to be greedy. People tend to be jealous. People tend to be possessive. So we need to set up a government, when you look at Montesquieu, that takes all these things into account. And of course, the United States Constitution is a, uh, is a product of the Enlightenment as is the Declaration of Independence, which uh, takes into account natural law and natural rights. Now, I also have a video series on the Enlightenment philosophes where I go into detail about, uh, about Voltaire. I go into detail about uh, Montesquieu and Diderot and Adam Smith and Kant and Rousseau. So you might want to take a look if you're looking for some more enlightenment stuff, you may want to take a look at what I'm offering there. Okay. So we want to make sure that that's, uh, that that's happening. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's go ahead and move on to the next, uh, on to the next question. Okay. So going on from there. All right, so let's see what else is uh, what else is happening there. All right, so going on to the next question. All right, um, is the Cold War? Cameron wants to know: Is the Cold War a common subject on the exam? If so, what are the most important things we need to know? Now, as far as common subjects on the exam, we need to realize that this exam is not comprehensive. That some years the Cold War may be the DBQ, like there may be a year where that's the DBQ or there's an LEQ on the Cold War. Other years it may not be on the exam at all. So it's not so much whether it is a common subject, but it's more about, yes, it could be on there. Now, a few things that I would tell you to look at, you would want to know about, first of all, the Marshall Plan. Um, the Marshall Plan really, and this is something that was kind of addressed in an LEQ, um, that it was talking about the relationship between the United States and Europe after World War I and World War II. So after World War II is like the first time that the United States took an active interest in Europe. Um, for the purpose of containing communism. Remember, after World War II, Stalin asked for a sphere of influence, the Eastern Bloc. And so the concern was, what if the communists are looking to take over the entire European continent? So the United States began taking a leadership role as uh, you know, a superpower, as this country that, uh, you know, the United States is the third largest country in the world, a distant third, but much larger than any European country and very prosperous. It wasn't destroyed by the war. And so the United States, in order to uh, in order to stop communism from spreading, the Marshall Plan, otherwise known, officially known as the European Recovery Plan, uh, this was something that um, th that was aimed at making sure that these European countries didn't become communists. France, for example, uh, you know, had a uh, you know, very viable communist party. And so they didn't want that to become a to become a thing. And so the, the thing is that the United States is throwing around money to try to uh, make sure that European co countries can rebuild their governments and that they will be allied with the Western democracies and not ally themselves with Soviet communism. So another thing I would note is I would look at some of the Soviet premiers. So for example, the Brezhnev doctrine, um, which was kind of the opposite of the Truman doctrine um, in the sense that the Truman doctrine was about containing communism. Um, but the Brezhnev doctrine was about if there is, um, if a liberalizer is elected, okay, if there is a liberalizing figure that's elected, then, you know, what we're looking at there is that the Soviets decide that they, you know, need to, they need to intervene. So the Prague Spring, the Brezhnev Doctrine 
Britain was an answer to the Prague Spring. Okay, so that's really like uh, the Prague Spring was when Brezhnev um, intervened uh, in that, uh, you know, there was a liberalizer that was elected there. And so with the Prague Spring, uh, you know, later the Brezhnev Doctrine, which say is saying that if an Eastern Bloc country, you know, Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Romania, any of those countries um, starts to, uh, you know, it looks like that they are being taken over by a government that is hostile to the interest of socialism, then it is a matter um, for all socialist countries. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's something that that justified Soviet intervention. Okay, and so as far as that, uh, the Brezhnev doctrine was uh, was basically it was renounced by Gorbachev. Okay, it was renounced by Gorbachev, and Gorbachev, of course, uh, was also responsible for Glasnost and Perestroika. Glasnost. Now remember, glass. Okay, so we can see through it. Glasnost. I call it Glasnost. It's a written test, right? So we can see through it. Glasnost is openness. Okay, Glasnost is openness, and so Gorbachev said we are going to have a greater degree of openness uh, now in the Soviet Union, and that included uh, that, that included. Okay, that included criticizing the government, that uh, as far as Gorbachev was thinking, that criticism of the government, um, you know, and this is good, uh, you know, Yovana, I actually, it looks like I'm timely. You just asked the question, could I go over the end of the Cold War? And that happens to be what I'm doing. So, so glad to see that, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so Glasnost is openness. I can see through it. Um, and so criticizing the government, that could make the government stronger. Now, we want to understand the purpose of Gorbachev's reforms, okay? Glasnost and then perestroika. Perestroika was restructuring, okay? So restructuring, stroika, structure, stroika, structure, okay? So perestroika, um, what we're looking at with perestroika is, uh, let me uh, let me do something real quick. Okay, so... Uh, Okay, so as far as that goes, perestroika is restructuring, okay? So that is trying to reform. Now, Gorbachev, with the glasnost and perestroika, he was trying to save the system. He was trying to save the system, but in doing so, um, it was, uh, you know, it actually facilitated it, it it escalated basically uh what do you call it uh you know it accelerated there we go think of uh you know acceleration due to gravity that is uh that is galileo okay so as far as that goes, that it brought about a more, you know, a faster um, end to the Soviet Union. So Glasnost and Perestroika were designed in order to, uh, you know, in order to save communism, but that's not how it worked. Okay. Now, also, let me make sure that uh, I'm not only on Twitter at Tom Ritchie, but I'm also on Instagram at Tom Ritchie. And I'm going to uh, shout out to people who are following me on Instagram. So we've got Gabby Michael. Um, we've got Emma Quang. Um, when y'all follow me on Instagram, uh, Aubrey B0812, um, I will be shouting out to people who are following me on Instagram. So I'm going to be checking out Instagram every once in a while um, and to look at, uh, to see who's following me on there. And so as far as that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just to make clear too, um, that the AP Euro exam, uh, my friends at Think Fiveable, um, which uh, I'm going to be doing some cram sessions the next couple nights. Y'all might want to follow Think Fiveable or go to fiveable.me to get access to those things. Okay. So we want to make sure that, uh, you know, y'all know that that's coming up and at Tom Ritchie on Instagram. Remember, multiple choice strategy session, 9 p.m. There is a link in the description of this, uh, of this thing. And that's going to be a work session. It's going to be worth it. Uh, you know, I wouldn't charge for it if I didn't think it was worth it. Also, remember, ladies and gentlemen, the Romulus app. And thank y'all for hearing a few words from our sponsors. So with that, let's go ahead and go to the next question here. All right. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, all right. So 
going from uh, going from there at Tom Ritchie help. I am here to help. Okay, Kaylee, I am here to help. Now, um, Alice, in terms of what's the difference between liberalism and socialism? Now, what we want to understand here is classical liberalism. Okay, when we think about classical liberalism, which is the, you know, the uh, 19th century liberalism, that it's based on the individual. Conservatism was based on groups, each of those groups having their distinct privileges. Privileges. Liberalism proposed a solution. Let's organize society based on the individual. And so what we're talking about here is a free market economy, you know, economic freedom in the sense that uh, there should be little government regulation. There should be low taxes. And so that's uh, that's classical liberalism that basically we want the individual to be able to have those natural rights of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness, or as Locke said, life, liberty, property. But Locke and Jefferson, great examples of classical liberals. Now, so from there, we want to think about socialism is about, um, instead of like, you know, conservatism, which is about like these, uh, you know, these old groups, you know, that have these these groups that each have their privileges. Now, of course, nationalism proposed, let's let's reorganize everyone on the basis of nations. OK, so, you know, if you're French, if you're German, I uh, remember primarily based on language. Now, socialism is like, look, let's let's organize based on the whole group or by social class. Remember that Marxism is based on social class, like in looking at history. Um, through the lens of social class. So with that, now speaking of classical liberalism, okay, Sydney is asking me to go over Adam Smith. Now remember that I have a video focusing on Adam Smith, but we want to understand Adam Smith in the context of the Enlightenment. And another thing that we associate Adam Smith with is economic liberalism. So we always want to note here that when we're thinking about, uh, you know, liberalism, classical liberalism, these are the banner carriers of the Enlightenment, okay? They are um, bringing the Enlightenment into uh, you know, into the 19th century and the principles of the Enlightenment. So Adam Smith was the one who laid the foundation for economic liberalism, which was already to some extent being being used. If you've already, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, if you've taken U.S. history already, you might have gone into salutary neglect. That was basically economic liberalism, okay, but just not uh, on paper. On paper, it was mercantilistic. And then after the French and Indian War, Parliament started forcing mercantilism on the colonies. The wealth of nations, what Adam Smith was doing was he was challenging what is it that creates the wealth of nations. Now, mercantilism, what mercantilism was about um, was uh, you know, when we look at mercantilism, we are thinking in terms of, uh, you know, the wealth of nations comes from precious metals, comes from gold and silver. And so therefore, what we've got to what we've got to do here is let me see here real quick. Just got uh, something I've got to got to look at real fast. All right. And. OK, uh, that mercantilism says that the wealth of nations is measured in silver and gold. OK, so we want to, according to mercantilism, we want to minimize imports. OK, because the thing is, when we import, we're giving away silver and gold. We're giving away our national wealth um, in order to uh, in order to trade. And that's why mercantilism uh, was based on heavy government regulation of trade in order to uh, discourage uh, in order to discourage imports. Now, Adam Smith is laying the foundation for free trade. Now, one thing to note, though, when we talk about capitalism, OK, when we talk about capitalism, we need to realize that both uh, mercantilism and economic liberalism, Adam Smith's liberalism, are examples of capitalism. Uh, that, you know, when we think about this, we want to think about economic liberalism in particular, um, because both of these systems are based on, you know, to some extent, capital. Now, Adam Smith also um, is borrowing from the physiocrats who defined, uh, defined wealth by land, okay? But the thing is, Adam Smith in Wealth of Nations was challenging the whole idea that national wealth is a product of 
uh, you know, is a product of how much silver and gold that you have. OK, so we've got that. All right. So going on to uh, to the next one here, I tell you what, uh, still nobody signed up for the multiple choice strategy session. I hope uh, once this session concludes that y'all think about that because it's going to be very helpful, very interactive. Uh, I'm only going to be there with the people who are paying to be in there and we're going to get uh, really deep into the strategy. OK, so make sure that uh, y'all at least give that give that a look and remember the Romulus app. Let me go ahead and take a look at my Instagram. I promised that I'd shout out new Instagram followers. Oh my goodness. Okay. I've got a uh, friend at the, uh, the calf fry festival, uh, which is uh, going on in Oklahoma right now. Uh, all right. So, uh, so yeah. Wow. Okay, so if anybody's from Oklahoma knows about the Stillwater Calf Fry, I tell you what, that is quite a festival. Um, so as far as that goes, let's go ahead and see who's uh, following me on Instagram. We've got uh, Alec uh, Yuraj, we got Jake, uh, Aiden, Evan. Okay, so M. Schwartzman. All right, Brandon, thank you for the follow. Um, Isabel D. One twenty nine. Um, C. X. X. C. I'm guessing Cassie. Just being creative. Kylie. We've got a couple of Kylies here. Um, Kylie Berg and Kylie Rashkin. Um, Aiden, Camille. Um, Hannah, we've got uh, Raymond and Brianna. Okay, so and then Sophie Juliana or Sophie Juliana, depending on how we want to pronounce that. It's a written test. Camel Fitness. Okay, so uh, somebody is uh, somebody's exercising, I guess, out there. Spam. I've got spam accounts following me. Abby Marie twenty seven. Shout out to all of you new Instagram followers. Instagram is a great way to keep up with what I'm doing. Twitter and Instagram, you'll get those uh, those announcements there, and so. So those are great ways to keep up with what I'm doing. Okay, so going back to our, uh, you know, going back to our questions here. Oh, I tell you what. All right, Danu, my new best friend here. Um, there's only one. E I tell you, I'm following back here. Can you talk about Peter the Great and absolutism? P P L Z. All right. And I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm representing the Netherlands because they've got statues of Peter the Great in the Netherlands. Like he's actually uh, the the Dutch royal family is related to the Romanov dynasty. And they have even got in Zondam like this cabin Peter the Great stayed. And I've got a video about this. But yes, of course, I can talk about Peter the Great. He's like my favorite. OK, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, or as the Russians would call him, Pyotr Veliki, uh, Peter the Great. OK, so that is, uh, you know, that's how you would say that in Russian if we've got any Russian speakers out there. Uh, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, Peter the Great. OK, so when he took over in uh, Russia, I think about it as W's. OK, now I've got a 20 minute video where I go into this very thoroughly, but W's here westernization and warm water ports okay those are peter the great's uh loves okay so he wants to westernize he wants to remake russia in the image of europe no more of these long beards and no more of these long robes that he wanted his nobles uh you know having you know peter the great had like a mustache he shaved which this wasn't in the style of the Russian boyars, um, the Russian nobility. So they wanted long beards. Peter the Great's like, no, uh, we need to look more like Europe because Europe is, uh, you know, Europe is on the cutting edge. And so we need to be more like them. So he wanted to westernize. OK, so westernization. And uh, then going into warm water ports that when Peter became czar, the Russians only had um, a port in, uh, you know, in Archangel, which was frozen for half the year. And so Peter the Great starts looking for warm water ports. Now, like other absolutists, Peter the Great fought wars. OK, Peter the Great uh, fought wars in order to achieve his policy aims. So he went down to the Black Sea in the Azov campaign. And of course, he fought the Great. Great Northern War against the Swedes because he wanted a port in the Baltic Sea, which that's where he built his own city. Now, technically named for his patron saint, St. Petersburg, but come on now, we all know who that city's really named after. And Peter also went to Western Europe on his European tour and, uh, you know, went to the net, spent most of his time in the Netherlands and in, uh, in London. Okay, so he went to the Netherlands, then he went to England. These were the two places 
places that were most uh, they were most prominent in terms of navies, that Peter the Great was the father of the Russian Navy. Now, also, he was a pioneer of civil service with the table of ranks. He had these 14 ranks of civil and military service that no matter who your daddy was, uh, you ended up starting at the bottom and working your way up. So Peter the Great was reforming things in terms of civil service as well. So those are some things about Peter the Great. I'm so such a big Peter the Great fan. Okay. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for answer for asking that question. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, I'm taking questions on Twitter. You're more than welcome to chat um, because we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we, you're more than welcome to chat with us. Um, but uh, at the same time, I'm taking questions from Twitter. And remember, I only see your question if you are following me on uh, on Twitter. So keep that in mind. Let's make sure that uh, that you've got that. All right. And remember, again, another quick uh, trip to Instagram and to see what we've uh, what we've got here. All right. So uh, going from uh, there, uh, B Shriner 2022. Um, let's see. And I think Kylie. OK, well, maybe we didn't have another rush of followers here. Um, so with that, OK, Devin, uh, we've got Gabe and Abe and the Kenneth Chang, um, KT Wade. Thank you for the follow, Angelina. Um, Severino, thank you so much. Uh, the Dave O2, PLM dot eventing. Y'all have such interesting things here. All right. So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, uh, Katie. And thank you, Olivia M. Burns. Okay. So lots of shout outs here um, this evening. Thank you so much for um, the follows here on Instagram. Very, uh, very happy to see those. Okay. So let's go ahead and get on back. Hopefully y'all are downloading the Romulus app. Okay. Romulus Euro app, um, which when we started this broadcast, was 29 on the app store and hopefully we will uh you know that we'll see that uh, pretty soon um go uh, even ranked higher than that okay so as far as that uh, as far as that goes ladies and gentlemen okay going on to the next question remember that I'm taking questions via Twitter okay so going on with that <laughs> And remember the multiple choice strategy session, ladies and uh, ladies and gentlemen. OK, um, the multiple choice strategy session. Let's say, oh, OK, I need to y'all take yourself a little break uh, to go uh, look at the Romulus app. OK, so I need to uh, I need to integrate this thing with uh, with Stripe. OK, so let's see. Um, OK, so your payment data securely managed by Stripe. Um, one one thing I need to look at real quick, because it may be that nobody is, uh, you know, is doing that because um, let's see. So let me run in here and let's say that uh, email. Um, all right. So. Let me just run in here and I'm not exactly sure what it's OK. So I need to integrate. I need to do this real quick because if anybody's trying to connect, it looks like somebody might have tried to buy in there and I've got to connect. Uh, I've got to connect this with my account. OK, so that's going to just take me just a second. All right. Y'all go take a look at the Romulus app. I'm uh, sorry about that. I'm getting into uh, getting into Crowdcast, which I've been using uh, with Fiveable. OK, but I'm actually looking at my own account now. Uh, so. OK, so going from there. OK. Oh, my goodness. They're getting really. Uh, let's see. That. OK, my EIN, they're even wanting my employer identification number. Um, I will be right back, ladies and gentlemen, and we will have some reviews. So y'all keep uh, y'all keep the questions coming. Y'all keep the chat going. Go check out the Romulus app. I'm sorry about this. Uh, it's just needing my urgent attention here. And so, uh, yes, uh, lots of things are needing my urgent attention right now. But you are included in that. OK, so let's see. Um, OK, so let's see. Um, I need to go in here and get my let's see. So my employer, I'm a tax identification number. Da 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 da. OK. 
Now, it sounded like I was saying Dada, right? That I'm talking about nonsense 20th century art. Um, so then we go here. All right. So I've got that. And. Okay. Okay. So please select industry, education. Okay. So education. Okay. So we've got that. All right. So with that, um, okay, so within, uh, okay, so. Okay, gosh, they're getting a lot of stuff from me here. All right, so let's see. I mean, I guess when we're taking like credit cards, I'm trying to simplify this because that way I'm not having to do this on my actual website. Um, let's see. All right. So again, sorry about this, ladies and gentlemen, but the good news is that we are going to, uh, you know, we're going to be in a situation where you can actually sign up for this, uh, this session. I knew there was going to be some kind of, uh, thing here. All right. So as far as that goes, this is the name show up on your customer's bank or credit card statements. Okay. Tom Ritchie worldwide. I'm a LLC. Okay. Okay. So got that. And Let's see. Let's see. All right. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully we're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. Got to get the uh, the routing number and the account number. I'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Again, y'all just uh, take a look at one of my videos or something like that. We're going to, uh, we're going to get this uh, very soon. I've just got to run and go get a business check real quick. All right. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. We should be uh, fully back in action within the next five minutes or so. OK, I've just got to got to put some stuff here. Let's see. Bank routing number. And I'm trying. Usually I would be repeating this to myself, but I'm having to not repeat it to myself um, because then y'all are going to have like all of my account information. Right. OK. So. Uh, all right. OK. And now I've got to put in my mobile number. OK, so we've got that. We're going to send a text over there. OK, so let's go ahead and I get my six digit verification. All right. Almost there. Almost there. OK, and so successfully enabled. OK, emergency backup code. So emergency backup code is in hand and email. OK. Oh, come on. It's not letting me off. Routing number must have nine digits. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Just let me, let me do it. Okay. So there we go. All right. I think, I think we're almost done here. Uh-oh. What are we doing? Ah, tell them about your business. Okay. So provide educational materials. Um, let's say so Tom Ritchie. Educational materials. Um, and uh, all 
All right, let's see. Let's see. All right, let's see where we are. Okay. All right. An account with this email already exists. Okay. So Again, thank y'all so much for your patience here. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, successfully connected. Okay, so if any of y'all have tried to sign up for that thing, I think that we're good now. Okay, Stripe has been connected. If you did try to connect, then that should be okay now. Okay, so that's something that is uh, that is okay. And we can go ahead and get back to our session, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so sorry about that. And we will just, uh, yes, confirm my email address. And there we go. Okay, so... Okay. Oh gosh, another verification code to my phone. Okay, so, oh my goodness. Um, okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are finally done with that. Okay, so you can now sign up for the uh, the event tonight at 9 p.m. And let's see if we've still got anybody over here. Okay, good. We still got over 500 people here. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, let's get back to uh, let's get back to business here, and we are going to get back to answering uh, our questions and all of that uh, all of that good stuff. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, so going into let's see what we've got here. Um, people, gosh, the chat is so funny. All right. So going to uh, going to Twitter here. Okay. So first of all, okay, Emma, you're asking me about the Crimean War, which I don't have a video about the Crimean War. Um, but as far as that goes, uh, the Crimean War is largely about modernization. Uh, this is really the closest that Europe comes to uh, a continental war between the Napoleonic Wars and World War One. Okay, so there is a period of relative peace for about a hundred years. The Crimean War is the closest thing to an interruption. And what you've got here is that the Russians are trying to take advantage of the weakness of the Ottoman Empire. Remember that by this time in the mid 19th century, um, the Crimean War is happening in the 1850s. Okay, so in the mid 19th century, um, what we're seeing here is that the Ottoman Empire is known as the sick man of Europe, okay? And Russia is looking to take advantage of this in the Crimean region, which we can see, of course, uh, they've done more recently um, that Russia is currently occupying uh, Ukraine, you know, Crimea, which belongs to Ukraine, and they're occupying that uh, in defiance of international law, okay? So they're doing that right now. And so this is not uh, the last time that Russia is going to have ambitions um, into moving into Crimea. And so Russia's trying to move into Crimea. Britain and France are like, uh-uh, balance of power. Okay, so then Britain and France, they go to war with Russia. And from there, uh, you know, you see that, uh, of course, uh, you know, you have a Britain, French, British, French, Turkish victory. But at the same time, there are a lot of problems that are exposed here. Um, and you're, you're getting into the second industrial revolution. So Alfred Lord Tennyson's charge of the night brigade, or not the night brigade, the light brigade, um, cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon and in front of them volleyed and thundered into uh you know into the mouth of hell rode the 600 okay um and so as far as that uh you know it's a beautiful poem but it's a poem about something that was really stupid okay that uh the british uh you know the british generals all you know they ordered this cavalry charge right into this like super heavily fortified position and so with that uh you know, this was one of the things that the British, after the Crimean War, uh, they stopped the practice of selling military commissions. That before the Crimean War, the British still had a system where if you wanted a certain commission of a certain officer rank, you had to pay for it. And that confined, that restricted the officer ranks to the aristocracy. And so what we start to see is the British government um, goes into more of a meritocracy uh, sort of thing, which uh, the 
the movie Zulu is something I always recommend. It's set in uh, you know South Africa during the time of imperialism, and the two main characters are two British officers. One of them a younger guy that is from one of these aristocratic military families. And one of them, a guy that's more into his middle age, and he is, you know, from a family that is not a military family, not a son of privilege or anything like that, not somebody's son and heir, so to speak. Um, so as far as that goes, uh, that's really the Crimean War. You want to know that as a modernizing war. OK, so that's that's important there. Um, important figures in the Council of Trent, Charlotte. I would say here that uh, it's not so much the Council of Trent is not so much important figures as understanding what happened there. Now, I've got a video on the Council of Trent um, that what we have at the Council of Trent is affirmation of Catholic doctrine, that there's nothing about Catholic doctrine that changes because of the Council of Trent, not one iota of Catholic doctrine. So no compromise with the Protestants on Catholic doctrine. And remember that Erasmus during the Renaissance, he criticized the Catholic church, but he only criticized church practices. Okay. He never criticized the doctrines of the church. And so with that, there's the affirmation of Catholic doctrine. The doctrine does not move at all. Then there is the reformation of church practice. So we see that the Catholic church, they start to, uh, you know, they start to found seminaries to train priests dealing with the problem of uneducated priests. They stop the sale of indulgences. Now they don't stop the idea the Pope can still give indulgences, but but the church is saying that we're not going to sell them. Okay. We're not going to sell indulgences. And then there are the founding, there's the founding of new religious orders. Now, if we're going to back it up a little bit and we're going to think about important people to know from the counter reformation, then you would think about Ignatius of Loyola. Okay. Ignatius of Loyola, um, who was, uh, you know, the founder of the Jesuit order. So there are new uh, religious orders. All right. And we've got some folks who are signing up now for the multiple choice strategy session. Now that it's actually possible for y'all to sign up for that. And I'm looking forward to seeing y'all this evening. Okay. And I've got a few more premium sessions. Now, remember, I, every day between now and the exam, including the morning of the exam, I'm going to be broadcasting free for an hour. Okay. So there's a combination of free sessions, Tom Ritchie premium sessions. And then of course you want to take a look at Fiveable Plus. If you want to hang out with me tomorrow, I'm going to be working with Fiveable and that's going to be, uh, you know, that's going to be tomorrow and Tuesday, that's going to be at 8 p.m. So what I'm planning on doing is uh, Fiveable Cram Sessions, which are for Fiveable Plus members, Fiveable.me slash plus. Use the code Tom Ritchie. If you sign up for Fiveable Plus, which right now I think is only $5 a month, if you use the code Tom Ritchie, then you will get a $1 discount. Okay, so you'll get a $1 discount, which basically I think if I'm, if I'm calculating this correctly, now now remember, Fiveable, that's them, okay? I am leading the session, but that's their company. But I've been given a promo code um, for, uh, you know, if you use the promo code Tom Ritchie, all one word, T-O-M-R-I-C-H-E-Y, it will get you into both of those sessions for, I think, $4. Uh, you know, it's a monthly subscription. Um, so as far as that goes and what you do with that in the future is, you know, with that monthly subscription is up to you. Um, so then I'm planning on doing public review at 9 p.m. Okay, so Fiveable Cram Sessions, which are for Fiveable Plus members only at 8 p.m. on Monday and Tuesday. Then uh, at 9 p.m., I'm going to be doing public broadcast. And then at 10 p.m. on both of those evenings, evenings, I'll do a premium broadcast. Then the morning of the exam at 9 a.m. Eastern, I'll be leading the Breakfast with Richie review that is going to be a free public review, but I'm looking at integrating Crowdcast. So there will be like maybe some tiers. So if you want to be somebody who is asking me questions and interacting um, that I'm going to have kind of, I'm planning on having kind of a two-tiered setup to where everybody can watch it, 
but they're only going to be like there are going to be people who have priority in asking questions um, if they're paying. OK, and that's going to be good for the people who are paying because that makes sure you can get your questions in there. So and then I'll also take some questions from Twitter. I'll do some Instagram shout outs, which speaking of, let's go ahead and check Instagram and do a few shout outs here. All right. So we've got uh, Caroline, uh, you know, Caroline Forrester. Very good. And we've got uh, car one, two, three, four, six. And uh, we've got uh, the real communist 2.0. Uh oh. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, and Irma Louise. All right. So with that and remember, the Romulus apps are available. Romulus Euro is at the App Store and Google Play for two ninety nine. English Civil War, please. OK, now, Sydney, I have got a series on the English Civil War, the Stuarts, the English Civil War, the Glorious Revolution for right now. I'm going to refer you to those videos because this is something that I often cover in the Breakfast with Richie broadcast, okay? So I'm not going to get into the English Civil War tonight because that often comes up uh, during Breakfast with Richie, okay? Oh, thank you so much, Eli. I've got some custom videos to make. You have reminded me that I've got some custom videos I need to make tonight. So my night just got a little bit longer. All right, so with that, uh, Mr. Minnick at DHSHS, um, the 30 Years War. OK, again, I'm going to refer you there, um, Laisha, to my YouTube channel. I've got a video on the 30 Years War. I don't want to oversimplify that. One thing that was actually the DBQ last year. And so, you know, if you're just letting me answer questions on that, you're not really getting the depth that you need there. So I would refer you to the video on the 30 Years War. OK, so with that, uh, Revolutions of 1830, 1848, Revolution of 1830, the French Revolution, 1830. Now, again, I have a uh, five part series on the revolutions of 1848. So we want to make sure that uh, that five part series that y'all are, you know, y'all are looking at that, uh, you know, because that's going to the first video is what really gives you the brass tacks. And then I look at individual revolutions um, and Elodie, what you want to do is look specifically at my video on the revolutions of 1848 in France. OK, the revolutions of 1848 in France. And so with that, um, the new monarchs. OK, so um, Abby, um, we've got the new monarchs, which I don't have a video on the new monarchs, but my friend Paul Sargent does. Paul Sargent will be joining me on Monday evening um, for the 9 p.m. review. OK, and he's also joining me at 8 p.m. this evening for some uh, AP government review. So the new monarchs, they're basically centralizing administration and they're increasing the power of the monarchy, but not to the point of the absolutist. Now, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain and Henry Henry VII of England are typically my favorite illustrative examples for new monarchs. And so they are trying to centralize administration and tax collection, also taking control of some things like the religious life of the people. Ferdinand and Isabella completed the Reconquista, which was the conquest of Granada, which was the last Muslim stronghold in Spain. Now, during the Middle Ages, um, the Muslim rulers and then the Christian rulers, as they're taking, uh, as the Reconquista is going on for several hundred years, um, that there was toleration for Muslims and Jews. Basically, if you've got Christians, Muslims, Jews, the Abrahamic religions, um, that these Abrahamic religions all live together in, in the Iberian Peninsula and tolerated each other. Now, once Ferdinand and Isabella expelled the Muslims and the Jews, also in 1492, once this happened, um, then what we're looking at in, uh, you know, as far as what's going on there is that they have their... Uh, the Catholic monarchs. OK, so the Catholic monarchs is what Ferdinand and Isabella called themselves, and they were championing the Catholic Church. OK, so they said that if you are not Catholic, you can convert, leave or die. And of course, the Inquisition. OK, that wasn't just a church thing. Ferdinand and Isabella invited the Inquisition um, to come into Spain. Now, another thing you want to note is even before the Reformation, 1492 was uh, a good 25 years before Martin Luther. And you already see this principle that Ferdinand and Isabella are putting out there that the rulers determine the religion 
for the people. Okay, the rulers determine the religion for the people. And so with that, uh, you see that going on. Now, Henry the Seventh won the last of the Wars of the Roses. And with that, he is consolidating again, consolidating tax collections. Uh, and he is, you know, Ferdinand, Isabella and Henry the Seventh are infringing on some of the traditional rights of the nobility and putting, uh, you know, putting the nobility, subordinating them to the monarchy. Okay, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, now we are uh, running uh, kind of low on time. Now I'm going to be doing a uh, an A-Push review at 6.30 with the Bill of Rights Institute. And then I'm gonna be back on my channel at eight for an AP government review. Now remember that AP Euro, again, I'm doing a multiple choice strategy session. I've got 18 registered so far. Thank y'all very much for registering. I hope some more of you register. Now remember, when you register, you can, if you've got some friends over, by all means, watch it as a group. Uh, I'm totally fine with that. Also, if you can't make it at 9 p.m., you're, you're actually Actually, it's 9.15. Sorry, but it's starting at 9.15 p.m. Eastern. Uh, if you're watching Game of Thrones and you want to watch it later, um, that's fine. Now, I watch Game of Thrones and I'm going to watch Game of Thrones once I'm finished with the strategy session. OK, so as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, um, the multiple choice strategy session is tonight. And also make sure you're following me on Twitter and Instagram um, because you want to make sure that you're seeing where I'm going to be. So Monday evening. OK, so tonight I'm doing the multiple choice strategy session Monday evening at eight o'clock. Um, I'm going to be broadcasting with Fiveable. Um, and that is for Fiveable Plus members. For information on that, fiveable.me slash plus. And remember, use the code Tom Ritchie for a dollar off. And if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, again, this is Fiveable. This isn't a Tom Ritchie review. This is a Fiveable review um, that you actually are paying like $4 to get into two cram sessions. And then Monday night, I'm planning on doing a small group salon review. Okay. So a small group group salon review, which is going to be reserved for about, uh, you know, about 20 people. And so the price on that's going to be a little more, but it's going to be a small group, making sure that it's kind of like me teaching a class. Um, that's going to be the salon review. Then, so that's going to be at 10. Okay. So eight, nine, and 10 every night. Eight's going to be with fiveable. Nine is going to be uh, you know, public and then 10 is going to be premium. The night before the exam, the premium review is going to focus on art. And then 9 a.m. the night uh, or the, the morning of the AP Euro exam, uh, then we are going to be doing the annual breakfast with Richie. OK, so remember, ladies and gentlemen, a quick word from our sponsors. Uh, remember that my Romulus Euro app is available at the App Store and at Google Play. Um, so make sure to get a look get a look at that. It's only $2.99. It's a trivia app. It's, it's designed to help you remember the things that you need to remember for the exam. And remember that I will be uh, making announcements on Instagram, okay? Instagram and Twitter, um, I'm gonna be making announcements there. And let's do one little round, last round of Instagram shout outs because we've got some new Instagram followers. Okay, so with that, Graydon, Kale to salad. Um, City is always all right. Okay. And thank you all for liking my photo of my daughter. Um, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, Aaron and uh, let's see. So Sydney, the kidney, Kyle Laidlaw. Thank you all so much for the follows there. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, again, I'm going to be back and remember to, uh, to take a look at the premium session tonight. All of the premium sessions, of course, point of view, point of view me, they're all going to be worth it. Okay. So make sure that uh, y'all are in touch and I look forward to seeing y'all. Uh, even if you're not paying me anything, I'm going to be here at 9 PM for the next two nights and 9 AM the morning of the exam, all times Eastern. So ladies and gentlemen, Alice, I would direct you to my women in the French revolution video series. Okay. So remember the free reviews are always, they're going to be 9 PM Monday and Tuesday, 9 AM on Wednesday. Uh, and remember the breakfast with Richie may have kind of a two tier thing to where if you want to get in the front of the line to ask questions, um, then you'll, you'll pay for that privilege. Okay. That's what, that's kind of where we're looking at, uh, at taking this, um, for right now. Um, so, but everybody will be welcome to watch it and I will be taking some questions from Twitter and that sort of thing. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, looking forward to it and thank y'all for joining me and it's going to be a great AP week. It is always a pleasure.